Hello everyone, welcome to Let's Talk Criterion. In this edition we feature the long-awaited 4K UHD upgrade of Terence Malick's Days of Heaven from 1978. Now this director already has an impressive list of titles in the collection, including The New World, Badlands, The Thin Red Line, Tree of Life and of course Days of Heaven. The Blu-ray and DVD release of Days of Heaven had gone out of print and as a result collectors were looking to Paramount in case the existing Paramount Presents range would release the title, as it was a Paramount picture. But instead, the Australian label Imprint came up with the goods and collectors bought the title through there when they released a Blu-ray edition. But now we can state that Criterion have the title back in their collection with a 4K UHD combo release and a separate Blu-ray. Terence Malick is an acquired taste as a film director. He began his career as part of the new Hollywood generation of filmmakers with Badlands featuring Martin Sheen and Sissy Spacek which released in 1973. That was the story of a murderous couple on the run in 1950s American Midwest. And then Days of Heaven from 1978, which detailed a love triangle between two labourers and a wealthy farmer, taking place during the First World War before a lengthy hiatus. Stylistic elements of his work have polarised film scholars and audiences, while many have praised his films for their lavish cinematography and aesthetics. Others, of course, fault them for lacking in plot development and character, and his work has nonetheless ranked highly in retrospective decade end and all time film polls. Now, Days of Heaven was Malick's second feature film after Badlands from 1973, and it was produced on a budget of $3 million. Production was particularly troublesome for the film. It had a very tight shooting schedule in Canada in 1976 and significant budget constraints. Film editing took Malick a lengthy two years due to difficulty he had with achieving a general flow and assembly of the scenes. The film was scored by famous composer Ennio Morricone and photographed by Nestor Alamendros and Haskell Wexler. Building perfection from chaos, Terence Malick's 1978 masterpiece is more than the last cinematic word in aching pictorial romanticism. It's practically an act of magic, and by all accounts this runaway epic should have been a disaster. The notoriously indecisive director threw out vast chunks of script during shooting and editing, and the cinematographer bailed halfway through the shoot. Delays kept forcing location changes and the crew practically revolted. In the end, the film, a love triangle set among the wheat fields of early 20th century Texas, shrank from the intended Tolstoy-sized sprawler to an impressionistic 94 minutes. The whole rambling thing held together by liberal doses of music and the improvised voiceover of Linda Mance, an inexperienced teenage actor found on the streets of New York. Of course, anyone who knows anything about Days of Heaven will recognise the litany of potential flaws as some of its greatest virtues. Criterion's impressive new 4K edition reinforces the sense that cinematic providence shone on Malick during what was obviously a very difficult time. Since the director is famously publicity shy, a commentary from his chief collaborators, that's the editor Billy Weber, art director Jack Fisk, costume designer Patricia Norris and casting director Diane Crittenden offers welcome production anecdotes and video interviews with co-cinematographer Haskell Wexler and cameraman John Bailey. They provide insight into the film's unique influential look. Their stories illustrate how this most troubled of productions became the most beautiful of movies. Now I'm going to focus on the production itself as it's here where a lot of work took place on the style and imagery of the film itself. Production for the film began in the late summer of 1976. Although the film was set in Texas, the Rocky Mountains are incongruously seen in the exterior scenes shot in southwestern Alberta, Canada 
in and around the ghost town of Whiskey Gap, located four kilometres from the Montana border, while the denouement was shot on the grounds of Heritage Park Historical Village in Calgary. Now, Jack Fisk designed and built the mansion from plywood in the wheat fields and the smaller houses where the workers lived. Now, the mansion was not a facade, as many people would think looking at it on screen. It wasn't. It was authentically recreated inside and out with period colours, brown mahogany, a dark wood for the interiors. Patricia Norris designed and made the period costumes. She used fabrics and old clothes to avoid the artificial look of studio-made costumes. And due to union regulations, Anna Mendros wasn't allowed to operate the camera at all. With Malik, he would plan out and rehearse the cameras and the actors' main movements. Anna Mendros would also stand near the main camera and issue instructions to the camera operators. To evaluate his setups, he had one of his assistants take Polaroid pictures of the scene and then he examined these through powerful glasses. The story would be told through visuals. Very few people really want to give that priority to image. Usually the director gives priority to the actor's performance in the story, but here the story was told through images. Much of the film would be shot during magic hour. Now magic hour is what Almendros called a euphemism. It's because it's not really an hour at all. It's about 25 minutes at most, and it's the moment in the day when the sun sets after the sun sets and before it's night and the sky has light but there is actually no actual sun. Now the light is very soft and there is something magic about it. Many filmmakers have looked at the magic hour to make their films work. It's limiting to around 20 minutes a day but it did pay out on the screen and it gave some kind of magic look to the film and a beauty and romanticism as well. Lighting was integral to filming and it helped to evoke the painterly quality of the landscapes in the film. Now for the shot in the locust sequence, that's where the insects rise into the sky, the filmmakers dropped peanut shells from the helicopters. <laughs> no CGI locusts here, I'm afraid. They had the actors walk backwards while they were running the film in reverse through the camera. And when it was actually projected, everything moved forward except the locusts. And for the close-ups and the insert shots, thousands of live locusts were used, which had been captured and supplied by Canada's Department of Agriculture. Now, while the photography yielded the director satisfactory results, the rest of the production was difficult. The actors and crew reportedly viewed Malik as cold and distant, and after two weeks of shooting, Malik was so disappointed with the dailies, he decided to toss the script and go Leo Tolstoy instead of Fyodor Dostoevsky, wide instead of deep, and shoot miles of film with the hope of solving the problems in the editing room. The harvesting machines constantly broke down, which resulted in shooting beginning late in the afternoon, and that only allowed for a few hours of light before it was too dark to go on. And one day, two helicopters were scheduled to drop peanut shells to simulate the locusts on the film. However, Malik decided instead he was going to shoot period cars, and he kept the helicopters on hold at great cost to the budget. Production needed to catch up, and costs exceeded the initial budget of $3 million by about $800,000. The production also ran so late that both Almendros and camera operator John Bailey had to leave due to a prior commitment on Francois Truffaut's film The Man Who Loved Women from 1977. Almendros approached cinematographer Haskell Wexler to complete the film, and they worked together for a week so that Wexler could get familiar with the film's visual style. Now, the cast for the film is Richard Gere as Bill. Brooke Adams as Abby, Sam Shepard as The Farmer, Linda Mance as Linda, she also does the voiceover, and Robert Wilk as The Farm Foreman. In addition, Jackie Schultes plays Linda's friend on the farm, who later helps her to escape the boarding school, while future Louisiana Music Hall of Fame inductee Doug Kershaw appears as the fiddler.
Days of Heaven opened theatrically on September the 13th, 1978 at Cinema One on 3rd Avenue in New York City. It had screened the night before for sponsors and benefactors of the Film Society of Lincoln Centre, and it was shown at the Cannes Film Festival in 1979, where Malik won the award at the festival for Best Director, making him the first American director to win the award since Jules Dassin in 1955 for Rafifi. He had won the award in a joint win shared with Sergei Vasilyev for Heroes of Shipka. Now this release consists of two discs, there's a 4K UHD and a separate Blu-ray, and it contains the following special features. An audio commentary featuring Weber, art director Jack Fisk, costume designer Patricia Norris, and casting director Diane Crittenden. Audio interview with actor Richard Gere. Interviews with Bailey, cinematographer Haskell Wexler, and actor Sam Shepard. And there's a written essay by critic Adrian Martin, and a chapter from Director of Photography Nestor Almendros's autobiography. And the cover is the same cover art as on the original Blu-ray by Lucien S. Y. Yang. A love triangle, a swarm of locusts, a hellish fire, and Malik captures all of it with dreamlike authenticity, creating a timeless American idyll that is also a gritty evocation of turn-of-the-century labour. Days of Heaven has a running time of 94 minutes, and it's released in the US as a 4K UHD combo on Tuesday the 5th of December, and its existing spine is 409. Our final film preview edition of Let's Talk Criterion will feature Albert Lamorice's The Red Balloon and Other Stories, and Guillermo del Toro's 4K debut on physical media of his stop-motion animation film Pinocchio. So until that edition from me, it's goodbye, and above all, good criterion viewing.